Sunal Katabuchi, one of the most fascinating directors in the industry in both his origins and the projects he chose. In his youth, he was inspired by future boy Conan, and he'd go on to work with Miyazaki for several projects, including Kiki, where he was the assistant director, which is why I assume he ended up here at 4C as producer Tanaka he used to have the prior relations with Ghibli. And they seemed to like Katabuchi enough to get him to come to the work with the company, giving him his film directorial debut with Princess Arietti. There's definitely a slow malaise to the moment to moment. This is a sort of world masterpiece theatre directing style. Familiar to Katabuchi, who helmed the Lassie adaptation of the 90s, stylistically he's always been specific about his research and details. Which is fun here because we see treasures from a different land that sparkle with a vibrancy not seen anywhere else in the castle walls. Geometric, simplified looks with flat shading. Almost going back to those days of Toei many, many moons ago. But then it's next to these detailed, lavish backgrounds. More so its philosophy is focusing on the motions of the characters, no matter how small. And the colour itself makes it feel like a piece beyond its age. It has a very warm, muted style. Especially towards the front of the movie in the castle. Perhaps that's to sort of heighten the sort of moody atmosphere. Overall, the movie has a unique look that the team pulls off flawlessly. Some of that might come from the character designer, who had quite a web-gen sort of modern look to his art, but in this context, it kind of brings it back to many generations before. And certainly you can tell this is a 4C production, as many of their motifs play throughout the film. Even having a, like its robust group of CG artists, despite the film having such a tale of older age look to it all, they work very effectively within it, almost to the background. You'll only notice it if you know. You know, there's composited zooms that give an enchanting quality of the space to enhance the animation, or specifically here, the meticulous flight scene across a floating woods. I mean, that's definitely a highlight. Eretti as a film finds its own approaches to tried methods, from the story to its animation, only made stronger by the musical score by Akira Senju. The composer to FMA Brotherhood, at times the movie just lets the orchestration convey the mood, if it be a small or long set piece, accompanied by actually a Russian vocalist known as Origa. But when to use music is also paramount, as silence plays a big role in the film. It's definitely a strong suit, the quiet reflections of Arietti's mental state. In regard to working on Princess Arietti, when I got into animation, I thought that I would be able to make anything I thought would be entertaining. However, I learned that there are often many challenges facing a film before it can be finished. I wanted to look at how one person can overcome challenges through the eye of one of the main characters. I feel like Arietti gave me an insight on how to overcome challenges. Since then, the experience has been invaluable to my career. Princess Arietti is a film where the main character strives to live a life that they desire. However, in the real world, not everyone can live the life they want. You see, Arietti almost goes on this grand adventure with these other travelers, only to be caught by the guards for having stolen the book. If she were any other girl, she'd rot in a different dungeon for the rest of her days. And that's the melancholy throughout. It's kind of overpowering. For most of the film, hope is a sparing thought for Arietti. The ability to control her future, as a pauper or princess is the same. There's a message ascribed to her that there is no need to fight destiny when just surviving is bad enough. Which in turn is the film's critique. When the princess is cursed, it shows how vapid the job of a damsel in distress is as if life's problems can be fixed by outside magic. This isn't just Arietti. The movie understands everyone is trapped within their circumstances. Both the sorcerer and Arietti are effectively in the same situation. They both want someone to rescue them. However, Arietti is able to find her own style of magic and use it to break the curse. Despite not being a witch, she found something inside her that wasn't supposed to be there. And that's a direct contrast to the wizards and sorcerers who are so dependent on the outside tools to harness their power, they're completely naked without them. But Arietti is always about finding another way to assess the problem and approach it. That's where her strength is. She isn't the beautiful fighting girl, and she certainly is much closer to Kiki, but not quite the everyday girl either which might be why she picked up such a big feminist following in Japan. And when we're talking about the feminist perspective, Hideko Taniguchi did a paper on Arietti's impact in Japan. Diana Cole's Clever Princess is one of the most widely read feminist fairy tales in Japan, and it was made to be an alternative to the conventional stereotypical princess fairy tales. 
The feminist movement made its way into fairy tale writing between 1979 and 1983, and this period, male and female writers began an important dialogue about what constitute a fairy tale as a reaction to the sexist, racist, and classist leanings of canonical tales. Feminist writers began to subvert older stories to create new ones. And this all makes sense because Coles, as an author, ended up befriending a group of radical feminists when she uh, lived in Greece, and they recommended her a lot of literature. The clever princess eventually became Princess Arietti, and that was translated in Japan by a group known as the Women's Group, a collection of four female citizens who were interested in gender equality, and they found it somewhere in London in a female shelter. Eventually, though, several years later in 1989, they were able to both translate and publish the book. My English copy of Clever Princess was published by Sheba Feminist Publisher, which was a sort of feminist co-op in England. But when it came to Japan, the story saw a couple of adjustments they changed the cover to make it a bold pink, which was associated with the girl power movement at the time. And um, it is fair to say that some of the ways that it has been adapted as a story affected how it would also be adapted into a movie. They did make their own little translation note, which I'm going to read to you all now. When we first read The Clever Princess, we were very glad to find at last a story of a girl who can tackle and overcome difficulties on her own. Princess Arietti overcomes every bitter trial imposed to her by the magician with her courage and cleverness. In doing so, she never fights or hurts anyone. Girls are usually expected to be gentle, sweet, and reserved. It would be wonderful if Princess Arietti, who was courageous, clever, generous, and vigorous, became the popular model for young girls. But no one wanted to publish the book, they weren't interested. The only place they could find that did was a woman's shelter, and it was unbelievably successful. We're talking in the first couple of months, it had eight editions, that's insane. And which is probably why it had such a long-term life in Japan, and eventually ended up getting this adaptation. Not, what, 20 years later? Tanaka once said, Princess Arietti started because a female chief from an animation coloring company one day asked me, if she could create a movie from the original novel. The author herself was quite puzzled about the popularity in Japan, so she asked the group, and they said it's because the original novel decries the idea of arranged marriages, which was still kind of an important and topical position during the 80s of Japan. The response wasn't all positive. Taniguchi, in his essay, states that many adult readers of all genders actually were not necessarily the biggest fan sometimes of the women's centricness of the story or how it presented males as stupid and evil. There was an attempt when translating it to change and admit parts that would be deemed mean-spirited, and the author had this to say about it. When I wrote the book, it was before my son was born. Having a boy child does somewhat modify your attitudes. You certainly don't want to bring your child up to regard himself as in any way the enemy. This was something I remember discussing with some of the women from the Women's Collective. Now, there's an argument on the other side that the director generalizes or blurs the feminist themes in a search for something more general or humanitarian. I disagree with the premise. The approach here is less on the nose. No one is shouting, she can't be clever, how will she ever find a husband? But the character of Arietti is the same. And if anything, she shows herself to be even bigger of inspiration since the story is so heavy with melancholy in comparison to the book. In context, the book paints a happier princess who seems mildly annoyed by the problems in her life, but not burdened. She just, uh, she just, you know, she gets on with everyone. She's just having a good time. Ariety in the movie is less outwardly confident at first and is full of loneliness. She is constantly barraged by suitors who are complete creeps pretending to be Prince of Charmin, but are closer to snakes and weight, which is really kind of uncomfortable considering how young the princess is in comparison to these guys. It's very, very reminiscent of Griffith, but without any of the charm. But we'll, we'll get back to him later. The characters are cynically cold. Rarely do they have much warmth towards Arietti. She's still very open-minded, opinionated, but the movie version knows that she has to speak carefully. And the world around her has definitely been fleshed out more so. The movie explores the town and the community aspect, but it's just not present in the book. The circumstance of the characters outside the princess is also taken into account, as well as her philosophy. There's also the, the side effect that there is no curse inflicted on the princess in the source material, and that does take up a fair bit of the runtime here. It causes definitely a lot of dread to be trapped within your body and aware of that, but not being able to do anything about that, it's kind of horrific. It also helps push the sort of animated fairy tale subversion in the same way as the book did, because then there's like a new form of tension in the story about if she can ever escape the curse to begin with. 
because in the book she's pretty much living very well in the dungeon and the tasks she's given are performed without much trouble at all. So at times I, I kind of do wonder like, why didn't she just leave and never return? I mean, I guess she was just chilling, you know, it all worked out after all. Movie Arietti, on the other hand, has a little interest in the tasks given and spends her time trying to free the town from the imprisonment of books. After all, they tried to save her once, so it's like her repaying her favour. They also pity Bokes. In the end, he's kind of pathetic, he's wasting away his life, as the last of his kind, digging around in the dirt, hoping he'll find his immortality again, which is very unlikely. And it was already an immortality that he spent wallowing to begin with, which makes him very much not very different than the average princess after all. Which is maybe why Ariety has a lot of sympathy for him, despite the horrible things he's done. In the book, there is very little sympathy. Now, in the movie... Ariety finds a way to escape the castle, her curse, while also replicating the look of the cursed princess so the sorcerer is little the wiser, and then comes back to save the village and destroy the castle. That's kind of like the most daring proof of her intelligence and like her just skills as a person. Despite being helpless for so long, as soon as she isn't, she's pretty much in control. And ultimately, the, uh, I think one of the nicest things about the movie is that her strength doesn't just come from her wits, but her empathy. To be honest, um, for me, the only thing truly lost in the adaptation is the pocket snake. That stuff is pretty fucking sick, dude. And that's, that's something nice about the movie is that, yeah, it still keeps the idea that Arietti, she succeeds where people fail because she tries something different that's not quite as aggressive or as blunt as the average knight. Because in the time that she was locked up, she was able to gain a lot of skills and learn much about the world. Certain areas are a little bit less overt, say, for example, the stuff towards the encouragement between women in the story, instead of hostility, it's still there, but some characters have become a little bit more cynical. So it is a much smaller part of the story this time. So yeah, so I can definitely see why some would argue that there are things lost here, but I do believe there are things gained as well, because the story now becomes more about the entrapment of women by men. No matter where you stand on the class lines, they are beholden to the patriarchy. Princess Arietti is a very inquisitive girl, who doesn't easily give up once she decides to do something. When her story begins, it's as if her true self is hidden behind a mask, but eventually she gradually manages to express her feelings and find a way to live her own life in full. Hello there, we have a cat over here. And you have just watched a 4 Sember or a 4C month video. Now there's supposed to be a bunch of them, we're supposed to be releasing them every day after all, and at the end of the month we should have a full expanded revised version for everyone to see if you want to keep checking them out there should be a playlist probably on the screen i'm guessing and to thank everyone who has helped support me during this period of time it's been a little bit hectic to try and get these videos out i need to thank all my patrons who get exclusive content i got a lot of stuff earlier etc etc jay steven's mum takiyuki suzuki alex moriarty paul sub sofa i hope i'm saying that right and chunks among all these other people i've had to expand I, we're in the editing dock right now but i've had to expand the screen because i knew there was more space i needed to get all the names on there so i've changed the angle slightly oh uh, yeah thanks for everyone for their support check out 